Uh, so before I talk, um, can I just kind of get an idea of how many of you have heard of Thornton Bar before? <coughs> Maybe about half. So am I asking <coughs> how many of you have no idea what you've just walked into? <laughs> So, those of you that know a bit, do you know a lot about the story? Just, just we Two of us have visited you um, three years ago when there was the Farming Systems Research Conference at Harper Adams. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, really good. And, yeah. and I'm a shareholder as well. Fantastic. So another bus in the audience. <laughs> 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 um, okay, so I work at, at Ford Hall Farm in Market Drain in, in North Shropshire. We're, we're um, 148 acres of uh, pasture land and we've been farming organically there since just after the Second World War. And in 2006 we placed the farm into community ownership um, and we had to raise £800,000 to secure the farm away from industrial development. So what I'm going to do today is tell you a little bit about that story, how it came about, and then a bit about what's happening at the farm today, what's happened in you know, the kind of 10, 14 years since we've put the farm to community ownership, and where we're looking to go to, to next. Um, and then I'll have a chunk of time at the end for questions. Um, so all it's going to be in about maybe about 22, about half an hour, wave at me, okay. um, to make sure that I do leave enough time for you all for questions. Uh, so this is Fordham Farm in the middle here, as you can see, we grow grass, um, oh, sorry, um, and we're bounded by the river, which is the River Turk, oh, oh my gosh, it's never escaped, oh my gosh, <laughs> oh god, I'm going to have to be in control of myself today. Uh, okay, so the River Turn is our boundary, all around the bottom here, and then it goes all the way around to the lowest white block, which is Muller Dairies in Muller Yogurts, and behind that is Market Drayton. And then the A53 main road comes across, oh my gosh, sorry, comes across the top here. Um, so we're almost a bit of an island as well, where 75, 80% of the farm is surrounded by the river and then the main road at the top, which being an organic farm is also quite nice. Um, and we rear really cows, pigs and sheep. Um, we're going back in the farm's history, we actually used to be a dairy farm. Dad was one of England's first commercial yogurt producers back in the 1950s. Um, and he was making yogurts at Fordor right up until the mid to late 1970s uh, when his first wife Mary was tragically killed in a car accident. <coughs> um, and other people like Ski and so forth with the kind of more processed kind of sugar yogurts started to come out. Um, and Dad came out of dairy farming then and went over to beef farming, which the farm has remained so ever since. Um, and here he is with some of his favourite friends, the worms. So um, you'll all know about that, being um, interested in organics and so forth yourselves. Um, but the farm had always been organic. Um, we actually farmed Ford Hall for many generations as tenant farmers. And Dad was born in 1915. And um, when he was growing up at the farm on the sea, chemical farm, fertilizers started to be brought into use. And his father started to use them. And um, Dad um, took over the farm in 1929, in fact, when he was only 14 years old when his dad died. Uh, and Dad left school then came to work on the farm um, with his mum. And um, he continued farming in the same way. It was a mixed farm back then. Um, they used chemical fertilisers on the land. <coughs> um, and there didn't really know any other way at the time um, with Dad being so young. And um, our soils at Fort Hall are very, very light and very sandy. So it didn't take long over those first few years when he was ploughing the fields up every year. Um, that more and more natural nutrients would just be washed out of the soil and he was replenishing that with artificial fertiliser, which worked for a while. But over the years, he found that every year he was having to put more and more fertiliser on the land to try and maintain the yields. And then the crops started to get weaker, they started to get diseased, and the farm got into debt. And Dad got himself into this horrible downward cycle um, within the farm and he had to find a way out of it. And one thing he did have on, on his side, he was a great observer, and he's a great lover of the natural world. And he's walking in areas like this wood under the farm, and he thought, well, how come every year in the woods it's green, it's lush, it's healthy, and it's growing every year, and it's on exactly the soil, same soil that right next door I'm trying so hard to cultivate and grow my crops, and I'm failing miserably, and I'm paying to feed it. What's the difference? And if you ever went on a walk with Dad, it was never too long before he was down on his hands and knees, pulling the worms off and, you know, pulling cow packs apart and showing you all the life that lives in the soil. 
And if you think about all the things um, that you see in the top view, which is a leaf litter, you know, spiders, centipedes, wood lice, and so forth. And Dad could see this life in the woods, and he couldn't see any of those insects and, and small animals in the fields he was planning to cultivate And so this stimulated his interest into nutrient cycling. And he then learned of all the billions of different bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, and so forth, and all the organisms that you can't see that are also in the soil, cycling nutrients, and finding food for the plants. And I thought, well, this system works. It's actually a system which, you know, Mother Nature has created, kept the planet going for millennia, thank you very much, and it's free. I'm going to use that. Um, and so then, since just after the Second World War, Dad turned the um, farm over to an organic farming system and then spent his life basically trying to encourage the life back within the soils again. And one of the first things he did was he turned the farm over um, to a pasture farm to cover the soil, protect that soil life, and encourage it to start to rebuild itself again. So alongside that, he also developed a system called forage farming. Um, this is a system which we still wouldn't afford all today. I don't know if any of you have come across it. A few heads, a few nose. Um, so basically it's a system based on outdoor um, grazing, uh, it's based on rotation around the farm throughout the year and it's based on a huge diversity of different grasses and herbs within the pastures at Fort Hall. So we have over, over 77 different plant species on the farm, so that's not including trees, um, across our pastures. And if you remember the, the picture at the top, those fields which are bounded by um, the main road are at the top of the valley. We're in an old glacial valley. And then the meadows all down near the river are in the bottom of the valley. So the topography of the farm really suits the farming system that we run. So in very general terms, during the summer months, they'll be grazing the meadows down near the river, and some of those are wet water meadows as well. And then during the winter months, they come to the fields up near the main road, which are great big old glacial sand deposits, which are really rubbish for retaining fertility, but are really amazing for drainage. So keeping the cattle out there during the winter months is perfect. Uh, and so it means that they are able to stay grass fed, very little inputs, but obviously with the system is limited because we can only rear as many cows as we can grow grass. Um, and so that's the system which Ben and I have continued to run at the farm today. Um, and but in the early 1990s, um, fights came to the farm again, and when Mother Dairy, the great big German yogurt maker, moved next door to us, and the irony wasn't lost in the press um, that they were eventually the downfall of the farm in the 1990s. This great big German, German yogurt maker and England's first yogurt maker fight each other. But it was actually our landowner that wanted to sell the land to Mullers for them to expand and develop the farm. So right throughout the 1990s, then my parents were fighting eviction notices. Uh, so my dad had obviously got remarried. Ben and I had come along. So when I was born, he was 67. When Ben was born, he was 69. So that's what organic living does for you, is it? Um, and what that meant also was there was quite a large generation gap. So throughout the 1990s, when my parents were fighting eviction notice after eviction notice for the landlord to be able to free up the land to sell it for development, Ben and I were both still at school. So we weren't really old enough to come and take on the farm. Um, and as a result, more and more money was being diverted into legal costs and court fees. Less money was being, being less back within the management of the farm. And there was less labour force on the farm as well. And all of that led to the farm's deterioration which then gave the landlord even more ammunition to evict us because we were then breaking the tenancy agreement by not maintaining the farm as we should do. But in the last 12, in the last 12 months, um, he gave us that eviction notice, it all went through arbitration, all kind of signed and sealed, all went in his favour. But in those final 12 months, smaller shifted their focus on another piece of land, which meant from a landlord's point of view, the immediate buyer weren't suddenly just sitting and waiting anymore, he had to reassess his options. And it was through those final 12 months that Ben and myself, and I was 21 and he was 19 at the time, managed to secure a new tenancy at the farm just for 18 months while the landlord recessed what he was going to do. So we took on Ford Hall. Um, as you can see, it was a bit of a mess. It had been left for pretty much almost 10 years. You know, there was trees growing even some of the, through the roofs of some of these buildings at the other side. Most of the livestock had been sold off to pay for the uh, legal battles beforehand. So we only inherited 11 cows, six pigs and six sheep. There was no fences or board gates or buildings that you could use. We had no money, no idea what we were doing. But we were young, so we were like, wow, how cool is this? It's really exciting, we've got a farm to run. Um, and then suddenly realised that we had to pay all these big rent bills and council tax, electricity, and all these things that when you're in your little flat university seem so tiny. 
And suddenly when you're renting a 140 or acre farm, they're a little bit bigger. So we knew from the very beginning the only way we'd be able to build the business and make it pay was to sell what we had directly to the public. So as dad, um, we had our first little farm shop with our little chest freezer. So one of our six pigs went off to the local laboratory, came back with sausage. Little chalkboard at the end of the drive that said sausages for sale. And we made about £50 in the first weekend and we thought we were rich. Oh my gosh, this is so easy. We've just made £50. <laughs> Which when we were at university, it would last a couple of weeks. It didn't, it didn't anymore. Um, so Ben and I both got jobs off the farm to kind of supplement the income. And we continued selling everything that we really could farm direct to the public. Um, and we managed to get a small low interest loan from the Prince's Trust for £2,000, which literally bought the skinniest animals we could find because A, they were cheap, but we, the one thing we did have was a huge amount of lots of lovely organic grass to feed them up on. And then we knew the improvement on those animals was coming from the pastures at the farm. And um, since the very beginning, we've sold absolutely everything we produce at Portal direct to the public. So whether we've been through the farm shop or the online shop or farmers markets, um, and that and the farming system with the foggage farming system works only because we continue to sell everything direct to the public. So we moved into a slightly bigger shop um, a few months later and start to sell all the local produce to kind of build up sales. Um, and then more recently Ben has also started to do outside catering through his catering trailers. Um, and his biggest um, concessions of the year now is that he's actually manages all of the catering at Edgebast and Cricket Ground. Um, and so he still leases some pictures out to other small producers that wouldn't get an opportunity normally to go to such big stadiums. Um, and he has about 10 trailers of his own there. Um, and this really is kind of what makes the money for his holidays and things, and the farm kind of just sustains itself and keeps everything going. But he's worked really hard to build that up. And so during the summer months now, the carp farm can hold about 200 sheep, just over um, 100 cattle, and between 40 and 50 pigs. And that was one side of the story, was building up the farm business and being able to pay the rent and kind of being able to stay there. But throughout that 18 month tenancy agreement, we also had to look for long term security. I was very interested in bringing the community aspect of things back to the farm again and people understanding where their food comes from. We started to build those connections. And then wanted to be a farmer and wanted to be a farmer at Fort Hall, you know, and that was his dream. And we didn't really know what that might look like, how would that work in the future, what do we need to do? So we started by looking back in the farm's history and actually seeing when the farm was most successful, there were lots of people involved. You know, Dad was doing the dairy, he was employing about 50 people. He did lots of WI tours and talks. He had farm trails, he did fishing on the farm. He had a country club and restaurant on the farm at one point. And so the farm was always a place that was really quite open to the public. And even Ben and I could see when we were growing up at the farm that it was when it lost that, that's when the farm kind of really lost its heart and its life. And actually, if you go back even further, because so many people always used to work on farms, they were always very central to the local communities. And so we started to kind of bring this back um, by holding some events at the farm. Really, it was anything we could think of to get the local community onto the farm. Hopefully for them to see it as an asset to the local area. So hopefully it's something they want their children to be able to visit, and hopefully therefore something they'd like to have for safe for the future. Um, and we had some volunteer weekends, um, where I initially began with some of my friends from university coming down and telling me what a mess the place was, but following up with they'd like to come and help tidy up for the weekend, which is great. And then we put it in the local paper, and then other people we'd never met before, they came and helped, and we just gave people soup and bread and tea cake and worked for the day and said thank you to us at the end of it, it was fantastic. But what it also meant was from the very beginning, there was a whole range of different people, different ages, different backgrounds, that were all part of bringing the farm back to life again. And it was looking a bit more presentable, it was getting on its feet, but we still didn't really know where we were going. Um, um, and so we, um, we kind of, all of this culminated in a community meeting that we held at the farm in February 2005. It was a month after Dad had sadly passed away. It was almost a year into our 18 month tenancy agreement. And at this community meeting, we asked the local people what they wanted from the farm, both then and in the future, you know, 10 or 50 years down the line. And we then said what we wanted from as farmers, both then and in the future. And it's by putting those two things together that we've created the structure that we've got today. Um, so the farm is owned by what's called the Fort Hall Community Land Initiative. Um, we're a community benefit society, we have charitable status. And it was set up to secure the farm for community, environmental and agricultural benefit. 
and to keep farmland affordable and accessible to new and young um, entrants to the industry and to start to re uh, rebuild those connections. Because basically the community came and said, we really want this to stay, we really want to be able to visit this, we want to be able to buy organic food from here, we want our children to be able to visit and understand what it's all about. But you know what, we're not farmers. So Ben was like, great, because I want to be the farmer. So I want to be the tenant farmer. So um, the structure is that the community owns and utilises the farm as a community resource. And then Ben is the tenant farmer, managing the land, living on site, running the normal limited company, but paying the rent to the community. And so we came out of this community meeting thinking, oh, this structure seems to work. It seems to marry everyone's needs together. But we still didn't have an option to buy the farm from the landowners. So we're still going back and forth. And, not getting anywhere with them, they just gave us blank answers. <laughs> and a few months down the line, just before the end, two months before the end of our tenancy agreement, we finally got a phone call from them offering us a first refusal option. It became to them 12 months later with £800,000. It was a take it or leave it offer. Um, and um, they extended our tenancy to cover that period. And we took it as far as the farm was worth, as a working farm, it was probably worth closer to 500000 but as a farmhouse, with, you could sell the piece of land and then sell the other pieces of land to other neighbouring farmers, not even developing it, it was probably close, worth closer to a million. And that's why so many farms now get split off as well, because they're worth more split off in units than they are sold as a whole farm. So the 800000 was a fair price in the middle. So we um, went about them trying to set up our legal structure, which actually back then was the old Industrial Provenance Society, but now um, we we it to the Community Benefit Society. But back then it was a, an old, very old legal structure that had sat around, no one really used it very much, so no one really understood it. Um, so it took a long time to get ourselves incorporated. In fact, it took us six months to get ourselves legally incorporated. Um, and so that left us with six months to raise £800,000. So off we went, um, and within the society we were able to sell shares. And we set the price of our shares at £50 each, as some of our wonderful members in the audience. Um, and those shares are lifelong, um, they can be passed down in the will, they can be returned to us for the same value that was paid if someone no longer wants to be a member. But it's one share, one vote, sorry, one member, one vote, not one share, one vote. So it remains completely democratic, irrelevant of the number of shares any individual holds. And it's completely non-profit making, so never return the financial dividend. So it's more of an altruistic investment in the farm and in the future. And we were hoping through the sale of these fifty pound community set shares that we eventually be able to raise <coughs> the eight hundred thousand pound to buy the farm and put in the ownership of all of these members. And so once we got legally incorporated, we set off doing the only thing we really knew how to do, which was keep involving people in the farm and just keep talking about it wherever we were. And so we kept holding our events, and we kept holding our volunteer weekends. And really all we did from the very beginning was open the farm gate, allow people to get involved, <coughs> took people's ideas on board, and that's what opened up doors as we went along. It really was that simple. Um, so we had one of our volunteer weekends here, um, and this one was in February of 2006. So it was about two months into our fundraising, we raised £33,000. <coughs> I've never seen that kind of money in my life before. I was amazed. So we set up our board of directors, which was all local people that were trying to help support and advise where they could. And we were like, oh, sure, it's, it's great. We've raised you know, over £30,000 in two months. But we've got four months left to still raise £770,000. How on earth are we going to do it? And I'm there going, I know, isn't this going well? This is fantastic. <laughs> There's a lot to be said, honestly, for young naivety, can't really do <laughs> um, And so we, you know, we had another one of our volunteer weekends, and then we had about 50 people over this weekend, and we did some hedge laying, and we did some tree planting. And people came from all over the country that would seen it um, on the internet and so forth, wanted to find out a bit more about what was going on. Um, and this guy, Christoph, um, I'm not going to touch you anymore. Uh, this guy, Christoph, was quite a pinnacle um, point of our story. He'd, um, he'd read about it. Um, in the newspaper and come to see what it was all about. And he came up from London and he came to do some tree planting and he actually helped to put the escape post in here, which was fencing off this tree planting area to keep the livestock out. And he came all the way back from London two weeks later with his family to show them the gate he'd helped to put in. 
And Ben was like, oh my gosh, it'd be that exciting, like gates, I've got loads of gates that you do. <laughs> um, but of course, it wasn't just the fact he'd, you know, he'd helped put this gate in, but the fact that he got involved in a project which he was really passionate about, and he wanted to share that with his friends and family. And he then wrote letters out to people, you know, encouraging people to buy shares and to help us raise the money. And this replicated itself so many times, and that's how it kind of snowballed out. But Christoph also went knocking on the doors on his street, and one of the ladies on his street happened to be a journalist for the Telegraph. And so he managed to badger this poor journalist into agreeing to do an article on us. And this article eventually came out in the middle of April 2006. So by the middle of April, we'd raised £77,000. <laughs> and I was reading all the local press, going, oh, we've nearly raised £100,000. Please, can you do another update? Yeah. Local radio, BBC Midlands, Shop to Star, they were really good at following the story. And they're like, oh, Charlotte, yeah, great. When you have actually raised £100,000, let us know, we'll definitely do another update. But you've still got two and a half months to raise over £700,000. Like, how on earth are you going to do it? And we're still there going, I oh, know, isn't this going well? This is fantastic. <laughs> and you can almost get the tone in the phones kind of like, oh, bless them. <laughs> and, you know, and you know, and we carried on. And um, and it snowballed, I don't know what's coming next on here, there you go. It snowballed overnight. This is the article here on the left that came out in the in the telegraph. So it was the front <coughs> page of the weekend supplement. There's another full page inside that. Uh, but it was also two full pages um, on Easter Saturday. So you can imagine what phenomenal publicity that was. To the point where we had to get an extra phone line installed in the farmhouse to cope with the volume of calls that continued to come in for weeks after this article. Um, and there was lots of people getting involved for lots of different reasons. A lot from farming communities and backgrounds themselves had lost the connections because the families had to sell the farm or they knew an uncle who used to work on the farm or they remembered playing on the farm as children and they wanted to have that connection back. A lot of people had seen the struggles that farming had had over the years and wanted to do something practical to support it. For some it was the fact the farm had been organic for so long, for some it was related to wildlife and biodiversity, some people hated development, going onto farmland all the time, some people just saw two young people doing mad crazy things and wanted to help them on their way, you know, so there was lots of different reasons that people got involved. And in the last two weeks, of, and out of the back of this, there was lots of other press, the Mail, the Guardian did it, Express, so forth. Um, and we were even in the Japanese Times, um, some Greek eco magazine, um, a Italian fashion magazine, where they flew a photographer from Italy to take photographs of a run-down farm for a fashion magazine. Like, really? <laughs> but it is meant that we've got about 300 shareholders now outside of the UK in Australia, America, Hong Kong, <laughs> Bahrain, um, Canada, um, South America, really random places that you wouldn't think cared about this tiny little farm in Market Drayton, North Shropshire. Because it's not just that it was a formal farm in Market Drayton, but they were, we were representing, in fact, something that's happening right across the world, never mind like in, uh, in Shropshire. And the last two weeks of the campaign, we still had a quarter of a million pounds to raise, and it came in in those final two weeks. Now, back then, um, everything was mostly by cheque. It isn't like it is now, all online. So we had the postman literally bringing sacks of posts to the farm every day. And our average shareholder is one or two shares. Not, so, you know, it's lots of people giving little bits of money, not a few people giving a lot. Um, and the postman was lovely. It was the same postman every day. We'd always wait for us to open the first couple of envelopes to see if we put anything inside in it. And we had 10 to 15 volunteers that just turned up every day and just kind of dragged them into the house to help us do all of the data processing. That one guy um, came down from Leeds the last couple of weeks and his job every day for eight hours was do nothing but open envelopes. He just opened envelopes, date stamped them, put all the checks in the pile, all the share applications in the pile, and that was all he did. Um, and then we had everybody else kind of data processing, writing the share certificates, getting everything recorded in the bank, what to get back to the databases and so forth. And we got confirmation from the bank that enough money was in and cleared the day before at our deadline. Um, and so we ran up the land agents and um, kind of set the bills in motion. The sister came down to sign the forms. But the first refusal agreement that we'd been given 12 months earlier, or been offered 12 months earlier, had never actually been signed mm. because it had all these covenants in that we <coughs> agreed to, like we wouldn't have been able to do a shop or anything that we're doing there apart from asking cows. So we had to get it all changed, and we'd only just got to the point of everyone being happy and agreeing with the first refusal option agreement. 
So um, the solicitor was like, okay, well, we've got that role to sign, and then we've got the other agreement that says we want to take up the first refusal option because we've now got the £800,000. So we signed them. And the solicitor obviously was understandably still quite nervous because it could still go either way. There was nothing that said this legally had to happen in any way, shape, or form. It was just a phone call as far as anyone was concerned, 12 months certainly, it just said this is what we're offering. So the solicitor went away to don't tell anybody till we know exactly what's sorted here. And earlier on in the week, I'd been talking to BBC Breakfast Television because they run the story in the last couple of weeks of the campaign. And they said, whatever the result, Charlotte, we want to be the ones to announce it on the deadline day, which was the following morning. So earlier in the week, I'd said, yes, great, come down on Friday. So all week, our shareholders and me in an email and asking us how we're getting on, we'd be giving them updates and then say, and on Friday, whatever happens, watch breakfast television because they're going to announce the result. And then the sister tells me not to tell anybody at like five o'clock in the evening. I think, oh, now what do I do? Like, not everybody was on email back then, so we didn't have email addresses. Not everyone um, had access to the internet to look at our website. So how are you going to tell all shareholders? And I thought, it'd be all right, won't it? So it's unbeknown to my solicitor, half past six the following morning, this great big satellite truck arrived and parked outside the farmhouse. Um, and then, then uh, myself was there, <coughs> so we were having the time, whole load of volunteers, and we're all out on the field, and the journalist was like, so shut up there, did you do it? And we all collectively went, yeah, we did it. And it was the most fun and enthusiastic thing you could see on breakfast television, honestly. Because apart from anything else, we were knackered. Uh, but also, if you think about it, you know, most of our events memories was we were growing up with a family fighting to save the farm. And then, um, and then we took that on later. So we didn't really have that many memories when the family weren't fighting to stay there. And your brain just does not catch up that quickly. Um, and we did three live broadcasts of BBC Breakfast Television that morning. And then BBC Radio 4 and Radio 2 picked it up and put it onto their news. Then ITV just turned up and then local press all just turned up and everyone came with bottles of champagne. So Ben and I are getting more sloshed throughout the day. And then kind of mid-morning I got reminded from the sister not to tell anybody. Which luckily was an answer sheet message because he couldn't get through because the phone was a bit bad. Uh, and then um, just after lunch, uh, we left us a message saying there had been a problem with the contract, so he was trying to resolve it. And it was kind of like mid afternoon, early evening, he left a message to say um, we've sorted out the contracts, they've been exchanged and accepted on both sides, you can tell everyone in the house. And it was and they did all of our land purchase agreement completely free of charge for us so we didn't have to pay a penny so then every penny that we raised went towards buying the farm and if we weren't successful then we had all of that money to send to give back to people as well because we had all of our postage donated we had envelopes donated everything was volunteer time um, so we were really really lucky so um, then ever since the 1st of July 2006 the farm has been placed into community ownership it's owned by 8,000 community shareholders across the UK. As I said, the land and farmhouse is rented to me <coughs> as a tenant farmer, and he's got a 99 year uh, lease to the farm, which also has succession rights in it for his children. Um, and then we utilise the same land for community benefits. So I now work my day job for the Ford Hall Community Land Initiative, which conversely Ben has a seat on the board, so he's kind of my boss, but I'm kind of his landlord because I manage the community trust. <laughs> Uh, so, um, and our next project after that was to tidy up the farm buildings because we had our office for about five years in these lovely porter cabins, which were fine, but we were, you know, we needed to move on, we needed to set down some roots. Um, so, this is what the farm looks like today, if you've not been more recently. Um, and so, we were able to raise £100,000 for our shareholders within two weeks to support the renovation of this building, and then the um, rest of it was EU funding with some of our own reserves. Um, and so this has helped us to um, introduce some more income generating activities on the farm to make it more sustainable. So we've got the cafe, Ben's got his farm truck and butchery, um, we've got a meeting room, or it's not there, a meeting room space upstairs and, and offices. Um, and on the Ford Hall, the um, Ford Community Land Initiative, we employ between 20 and 25 people throughout the year. Um, but with the farm business and with Ben's catering business, so the three businesses that work on the farm, during the summer months, we can collectively employ over 100 people, which on 140 acres of extensive, managed farmland is pretty impressive. 
Um, we now also have children's shares um, and we have our newsletter which goes out. We do a lot of education and school visits to the farm throughout the year. Um, as I said, we've got our cafe, uh, upstairs function room space, a lot of events that we do throughout the year. Uh, we have a care farm uh, which works with adults with learning disabilities. So this now works at the farm three days a week. Um, and they work in our growing space outside. Um, and in the winter, they make jams and chutneys. This has worked right throughout the year at the farm and it works with individuals' personal budgets. So this was started by some local funding, uh, local food funding, and now is completely financially sustainable. So a lot of our projects, normally they're piloting with some grant funding and then we carry on with them by finding a way to keep them financially sustainable if possible. Um, our youth projects, this is still being grant funded and we're just looking at how to make this more financially sustainable at the moment. So this is working with young people struggling in school. Uh, for whatever reason that might be, the classroom's not working for them. They come to us a day a week, right throughout the school year, quite often for more than one academic year, as um, so we have them from age 11 upwards. And ideally, the younger they come, the better, so that we can um, help generate more of a change within their lives. It's called the Great Confidence Project, and that's exactly what it's all about. It's about building their self esteem, their confidence, their self belief in themselves. Because quite often you see these kind of young people, they might not be. Um, the classroom might not be suiting them for one way or another, but when they come out and they're working with their hands and they're working outside of the land, they are completely different people. And we work with quite a high ratio, which is what makes it challenging for the school to be able to fund completely. So we have one youth worker for two young people um, that can work on a farm, and they might do conservation work or green woodworking um, or helping to keep the farm accessible to the public. Um, and not so much farm work because there are cows and sheep cows not eating grass, so there isn't a great deal of labour that's needed. In fact, on the farm, there's only um, <coughs> one staff member that's part time that's needed to keep the actual farm going. Um, we still have our volunteering um, weekends and weekdays and opportunities, whether it be outside on the farm um, or in the office or in the cafe, all the different projects that we operate. Um, and we have free open access to the public, to the farm, right up. But normally, right throughout the year, although for the first time in 14 years, we've just had to close some of the trails, which I'll come on to in a moment. Um, we have yurts, which we went out for glamping. Um, we do lots of tours around the farm. We now do weddings. Um, ben and I have moved on too, so we both met our respective partners when we started volunteering. So you know, it's, farmers don't get that much time to get out and meet people, so you bring them to you. That's quite useful. Uh, in fact, we've had, I think, about four weddings from people that have met at the farm and about six babies now. Um, and then our most recent project um, was these water cabins, which started off as an office and then we moved our office into that nice new building. And then we moved our volunteers into our water cabins. Um, so we our volunteers needed a space as well. Um, and so um, we just finished this project last year um, and we've been building a straw house. So um, lovely round wood timber um, from Teapen in Wales with local straw bales, car tire foundations. And this is that building today. Um, so it provides accommodation for our volunteers, nice kitchen room space, our care farm, which was struggling to expand. It's been able to expand because we now have a nice winter space for them to be rather than covering onto a tiny little shelter in the garden, which they were doing. And they've got a nice big kitchen that can make jams and chutneys. Um, our youth project have got a nicer place now to go for their um, lunches and their rooms. Um, we also use it for weddings, we also have um, scouts and brownies and school groups that we can elongate their stay. So rather than it just be a one-off school visit, they can stay with us overnight for a couple of days. Because for us, education is all about experiences and memories and connections. So, um, or behavioural change is all about that, sorry, because learning something is only one part of it. You can know something, but unless you've got a real connection <coughs> to that information, what it means, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to change your behaviour as a result of what you know. Whereas, um, so what we're trying to do is give children and adults, where possible, you know, fun um, experiences on the farm where they can really build those connections to the wildlife, to the land, to the food that's coming from it, so that they have an emotional connection to the way that food is produced, and maybe that will then start to inform their value habits and some of their lifetime choices. Um, and so this is literally only just finishes last summer, so uh, we're just in the process of kind of building up the use of this building. So I was asked 
Um, to talk about maybe some of our failures, um, as well do this talk, and I couldn't think of any. <laughs> because it's not like we haven't done things that maybe we wouldn't do differently. We only do it differently because we've done it wrong in the first place. And um, I'm not think, I can't, I, I just can't think of anything, if I'm completely honest, because we've learned so much um, and nothing, we don't, nothing's been so majorly wrong that it's caused a major problem. But we have challenges, which is, which is slightly different, and, and we definitely learn some of our greatest strengths or our greatest challenges. Like, for example, having 8,000 shareholders is amazing. It gives us such a strength going forward as an organisation, but it's a lot to manage. Mm. You know, we have to employ someone two days a week mm. just to look after our members, change addresses, deal with um, what happens when people die, manage reversing shares if they're needed, selling new shares, sorting out the mailing for um, the grades of the AGM and so forth. So, you know, that's a lot of work, but we get a lot of benefit from it. Um, we're diverse, we do lots of different things, as you can see here. This is a real strength for us, but it can be <laughs> to manage. Um, and actually, uh, one of our biggest challenges is actually been finding the right staff. Because we do so many different things, a lot of these things are full-time roles on their own. So we have to find people that are adaptable at doing a little bit of a lot. Um, and I think that used to be more common than it is now. As businesses get bigger, job roles become narrower, skill sets become narrower, and then in smaller businesses, you need people to be more adaptable and have a broader skill set. So that, I mean, we've got an amazing staff team now, but it has been a challenge at least to understand in some sense what it is we're looking for when we're recruiting. And actually one of our biggest challenges came um, in 2016 um, when I went on maternity leave. And I thought everything was great and was, we'd left a really strong team behind. I was a lot crumbled when I came back. Um, and actually it was because I re hadn't really realised that the thought processes that were going through my mind for decision making, not everyone was really aware of. And so what we did when, um, when I came back was we did a massive exercise around our values, which I thought were obvious. Mm -hmm. But everyone gets involved for different reason, reasons and everyone has their own value system. Um, and you know, when we did that value exercise, it was really easy and, and everyone agreed on them really quickly which I wasn't really surprised about, but actually the impact of us all just agreeing what they were and buying into them has made, it's transformed everything um, with the same people, you know? Um, because we're, everyone is much clearer of the direction, is much more aligned, even though the diversity is there, even though it isn't a different direction to what we were doing before, but it's been voiced mm. and we've all made a verbal, agreement to it and that has been amazing and, I, and we now recruit to our values as well so skills is one thing but actually the values of the individual whether they're going to fit within the organisation is just as important um, and there's loads more things that we've learned I mean um, making the most of every opportunity seeing the open doors if you don't know where you're going that doesn't really matter no sorry if you, you need to know where you're going if you don't know how to get there it doesn't really matter but as long as you're heading in the right direction because even if you have a plan for how to get there, it's never going to be the same plan of how you actually get there in the end. Um, and so being open to being adaptable and, and changing as we go has been really important for us. Um, and we did do some research with um, Hill University um, back in 2006-07 and again in 2016, and that was published research at the time as well. Um, about initially it was why people bought shares and why they got involved so that's available I think it might even be on our website you can download if you guys want to have a look at it and then 10 years later we did it and 89% of our members feel just as engaged with that more so than they did 10 years ago which for us was a massive achievement because you know the hype of the campaign in 2006 was so strong our big concern after oh my god we've got this really big snowball moving how do we keep it moving? How do we not lose everybody? Um, and somehow uh, we have, which is great. And 98% of our supporters said as a result of them being involved with Ford Hall, they would, uh, they would support a similar initiative close to them, which is amazing, because hopefully that would be a bit of a catalyst for setting things out as well. 
Um, I realise I'm going over time. You didn't wait that, did you? No, Just well. let it go. <laughs> 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 I, 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 this, is, this is the last slide. Um, so, uh, our next big challenge is this field here. So, for Northern 140 acres in 2006, we put 128 acres into community ownership. This 12 acre field um, was not on offer. It's a field right, Mullers is right behind those group mm -hmm. of trees there. Uh, it's right next to the main road. It's one of the flatter fields on the farm, so our landlord retained that. That was kind of like his golden egg from the development point of view. Um, but when we put the farm community ownership, Ben and I were able to continue leasing that field, so it continued as part of the farming system. It actually pulls about 30% of Ben's winter grazing, so with the cattle being outdoors through the winter, we need those sandy dry fields for the go to. Um, in 2018, um, they met with us and they said, we are going to sell it for development and um, we're evicting you. They gave them 12 months notice, which was fair enough. That ended it set, end of September last year. So since the end of September last year, we've, that field has been empty. Um, the, our pigs are just here. They have allowed us to keep renting this little bit where the pigs are, which is fantastic, otherwise we would lose pig production at the farm because we don't want to rotate our pigs onto all of the permanent pastures because that, we would lose it then from into grazing. Uh, the rest of the farm is empty and he's trying to sell it for development um, and we are saying we want to buy it and he's refusing to sell it to us. It's exactly the same situation, honestly, as it was like 15 years ago now. Uh, it's only mothers are not people he's trying to sell it to anymore. I think he's trying to sell it to whoever he can sell it to for development. And um, we've made the strong case that we want to buy it, and they've gone, okay, but well, no, like because we could get more money if we sell it for development. Um, so we are trying to build the case with the councillors and, and planners and so forth um, to um, try and retain this field. So we do have a petition of support rather than a petition against us to take the positive tap on it. So if any of you would be happy to, um, to sign that, then please do, that link is at the bottom. Um, and it's a bit of a chess game really at the moment, we don't know how long this is going to go on for. Um, we don't know if this something might happen in the next 6 months, it might 12 months, or if they might sit on it for 10 years. We don't know. Um, it's, and this is the reason that we've had to close the trails for the first time ever to the public, because um, we've moved all the livestock onto the rest of the farm. That's put a lot of extra pressure on the land, um, and we've had a really, really wet winter, um, which is really just causing a lot of damage to the fields. And so, if the weather and climate carries on like this, you know, Ben's going to have to really assess the farming system, the livestock levels that we've got, and, and how it all starts to work. Because it's only a small farm, you know, and it's in the farming system that we run, we don't want to lose. We really believe in that can be a a really healthy way to farm for the land and for the animals and for us eating, you know, that meat afterwards. Um, you know, with it being pasture fed, it's got better balance of omega 3, 6 fatty acids in it and so forth. Um, but we need those sandy, free grain fields mm -hmm. for our winter grazing, otherwise it doesn't work. Ben's been able to rent some other land short term that alleviates it a little bit, but it's not the same quality of land, it's not as free draining, and it's only very short term tenancies. So, you know, we don't know how that's going to change in the future. So this is our kind of risk <coughs> that we're looking to at the moment. Um, and then, well, you guys might come in. I mean, to be fair, you might have ideas of yourselves. Um, we are really over and we've, we know a lot about what we're doing, but we're also massively still learning about it. Um, and certainly, you know, with regards to the farming system, Dad spent his lifetime observing and looking what was happening at the farm and the soils. And um, we didn't want to listen to what he had to say because we were his children and he was our dad and it was boring. And it's like, oh, again, dad, you're pulling worms up. And, oh. and then, you know, and we were teenagers and you don't want to know it. And then, unfortunately, when you want to know it, he's not here anymore. Um, so we're almost having to re go back and try and, and learn a lot of that ourselves again. Um, and certainly with regards to, you know, we believe everything affordable works and it's, it's a very symbiotic relationship between the community landowner and, and the tenant farmer as well. You know, we work very closely together. Um, but we haven't got the evidence that back up kind of that proves it, apart from the fact that we're still here and working, if that makes sense. Um, you know, why is it a good farming system? 
why might MAID be better or not than a more conventional system? Not just because it's crashed with ethanol organic, but everything else that's going around there are being proven in the soil all the time. Um, you know, and the, the community benefit alongside that measure and social impact is a real challenge. Um, so, you know, we're open to kind of ideas. We really want to kind of <coughs> open our doors and say, look, we'd like to work with people that want to learn more about what we're doing. We want to learn more about what we're doing. Um, so we're kind of really just, today, yeah, I'd like to just throw that door open as much as possible. Um, so I'm going to stop because I've talked for too long and, um, and then we can ask any questions. Yeah, so thank you very much.